If you have a Bible near you or around you or maybe uh, an app on your phone, I want to encourage you to grab that now and you could turn to the to the book of 2 Samuel, the ninth chapter. And as you do, just want to take a minute to remind everybody about what we're doing. We've been taking the last four or five weeks and the next couple to consider the life of David and to consider the life of David from the perspective that God had on his life. You see, on more than one occasion, both in the Old Testament, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, and the New Testament in Acts, um, God refers to David uh, as a man after his own heart. And we know that that doesn't mean that David was perfect. In fact, I want to encourage you uh, to tune in or come out to our Bible study next Wednesday, and we'll, we will look at um, an infamous episode in the life of David that was uh, very much um, imperfection, even at its worst. And we'll walk through that and even reconcile how God could still refer to him years, 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 a thousand years later as a man after his own heart. And hopefully we'll see some connections in that that will give us hope when we screw up. However, that's getting ahead of myself. Uh, we have taken time, and as we have uh, just kind of considered David's experience, we've remembered that a person after God's own heart, uh, they may be unknown to a lot of people, but they're always known to the one who matters most. And we, we remember that time where David was just out shepherding his father, Jesse's sheep, and nobody really knew who he was, and uh, nobody really expected him to be much, and yet God knew exactly who he was, exactly what he was doing, and exactly who he would be. And the same is true for us. There's great peace in knowing that in this world where you have to be a big deal to do anything, I'm so glad that in God's economy, you just have to be faithful and he'll do everything. And your life makes a difference. I'm sorry, I can't help it. It's Wednesday night and we get some leeway here. But man, I have talked to a number of people recently and had the opportunity to encourage them about the influence that their life has had on me or others that I know. And every time I have, they had no idea. And so there's a beautiful reality to that, to knowing that every little thing we do as disciples, especially as, as if we're living as his representatives, his ambassadors, and desiring to give out God's grace and kindness and love and mercy and justice wherever we can, it makes a difference and people remember it. I had lunch with a friend of mine yesterday in a town that I probably haven't done ministry in for um, at least eight years or so, if not a few more. And we sat down in a restaurant. The waitress came up, took our order, looked at me, did a double take and said, hey, how are you? I haven't seen you forever. And it just blew my mind. Even what I had been encouraging others with, the Lord was encouraging me because Man, it's been so long since I've been out there. And man, we might think that we're really no big deal, but trust and believe and know that through your belief and your discipleship in him, God's doing big deals and he'll get credit for it. And he may even allow you to have a glimpse into it. We also learned that even as David um, was going through some pretty crazy circumstances and overwhelming realities, think David and Goliath, uh, a person after God's own heart will exercise, exercise great faith even in the face of overwhelming circumstances or overwhelming fights or overwhelming struggles or overwhelming issues that we can live and move and breathe uh, for the glory of God and in his name. Remember after the David and Goliath incident, not too long after that, David went on the run for his life from Saul for some 10 years. And we realize and remember that a person after God's own heart will also um, uh, maintain amazing devotion, even in the middle of undeniable and unimaginable disasters. And I hope that we've been encouraged by those reminders. Um, <laughs> Josh 
taught last week, and I'm so thankful for the people that God has brought around here to do so many different things. And he taught through that moment where David had, after that decade of disaster, Saul and Jonathan had passed away, and David uh, ascends to the throne of a united kingdom. He brings Israel all together, and shortly thereafter, he brings the ark, which had been on the outskirts of their society, and he brings the ark back into the middle, the center of their society, not just practically, but even spiritually. And in so doing, he celebrates, and there were critics, and yet he said, man, I'll become even more, remember this phrase, I'll become even more indignified than this because of God's greatness. And we realize and remember that a person after God's own heart will always worship the Lord instead of worrying about the critics. And I would say this, the critics will always be there. They will never go away. They're always around. I would say that it may even, criticism may even be a tool that the enemy uses to bring discouragement and frustration and squelch and, and, and put down uh, the worship of Yahweh. And yet we have to rise above that and recognize Critics, uh, if, you, if, you've, <laughs> if you've lived any kind of life, and it's fun because I look at a, at a group of people in the sanctuary and recognize, oh, I'll bet we've lived some life, haven't we? We all recognize that critics are everywhere, and they're never going to be uh, gone. They're always going to be a part of reality, and yet we can still worship the Lord, not just in song and dance, but with our lives, no matter what the critics say. Well, tonight... Uh, I hope that we are encouraged by the realization, even as we look at another episode in the life of David, that a person after God's own heart will mercifully pass on God's amazing grace with every opportunity they have. Um, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to read about a story that I will say this, for me personally, it is... Uh, one of my favorite Old Testament accounts. It is, I think, one of the most dramatic, impacting, and amazing views of God's grace that we have. Now, it's hard for me as a human to say that because we all know that the, the whole of scriptures is filled with amazing accounts of God's grace. And let me say this, I think they, are, they, they all lead to, point to, and find their fulfillment in uh, Jesus Christ uh, living, dying, rising again on the third day and ascending to the right hand of the Father. That is the, the crescendo, if you will, of God's mercy and grace. But tucked all the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we have uh, one of the most unexpected little moments of grace that I had ever heard of. I remember reading the Bible for the first time and coming across this account one, being confused as to how to pronounce certain names, and two, being blown away by the actions. But to set the stage, remember this, that David has ascended to the throne of a united kingdom. David, the king that God had always, uh, apart from himself, God had always uh, had planned for his people. But before David was Saul, and so the people were used to having and wanting a king like all the other nations. And I think that's important to understand because it sets up this story as even more amazing. You see, the people wanted a king like all the other nations, and so they, they looked for Saul and found a king like all the other nations, one who would be selfish, one who would be a burden, not a blessing to his subjects, one who would... Uh, actually lead the kingdom in a tragic manner. Uh, don't forget, though, that all these other nations and their kings, it was customary in their day and age that when a king either passed away or was taken out, the king who replaced them, now remember, these are all the other nations, the king who would ascend to the throne in their place, it was customary. It was normal, if you will, even though it's atrocious if we think about it. But it was a normal for the new king to wipe out any threat to his kingdom, which would include any of the old king's family. Does that make sense? 
Now, I'm not saying this is right. In fact, I'm saying, even as I just used the word, I think it's atrocious. I think it's unbelievable. I am so glad that it doesn't work like that now. But this is what the people were used to, and this sets the stage for 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let's read it together. If you have a Bible, just read along as I read some of this stuff, and we walk through um, this beautiful passage. And David said, 2 Samuel chapter 9, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember, David had promised Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 20, David had promised Jonathan that when David became king, he would show his house, he would show Jonathan's family favor. He would be different than all the other kings. David promised that he, he actually made a covenant with Jonathan in second, or 1 Samuel chapter 20, promising that he would not wipe out his family. He would show kindness. Not only that, it's also worth knowing even as David mentions, is there anyone else left in the house of Saul that I could show kindness to for the sake of Jonathan? He had made the promise to Jonathan. Remember, in the story of David's life, Jonathan was what we would call David's best friend. And eventually Jonathan dies. And David is some years, 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 years later. Scholars debate exactly how much time has passed. But years later, David is reigning and ruling over a united kingdom. Things are going well for Israel under David's rule at this point. And he's sitting and he's thinking about the past. We know that he thought quite a bit about all that God had done in the past because he writes psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm, proclaiming not only that God would be faithful even during difficult days, but proclaiming God's glory and God's faithfulness and greatness and loving kindness even in the midst of every day. And David writes these things and these things are on his mind. And I gotta, I gotta believe that this affects the way he thinks and the way he looks out at his world. And so he says, is there anyone left in Saul's house that I could show kindness to for the sake of Jonathan. But it's interesting that he even mentioned Saul's house because Jonathan was Saul's son. Remember, Saul was David's enemy who tried mercilessly to try to kill David, and yet David says, well, wait a minute. You see, it's interesting to remember that not only did David make a promise to Jonathan that he would give his family favor, but he also promised Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, uh, David and Saul have an exchange of words after David spared Saul's life. And Saul says, when I am gone, will you please show my house favor? And David promises to do so. David promises to do so. I want to tell you, I believe this. For the sake of drama, for the sake of intrigue, for the sake of wondering, we should be asking ourselves, why would David do this? What caused this guy to do something so different from any other guy who would have been in that position at that time? I, I want us to be thinking about it. We're going to address it here in a moment. But David says, is there anyone left that I might show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Just so you know, in my version, I use the English standard version, uh, the word kindness um, actually means grace. It's translated kindness here. It's translated kindness in a lot of versions, but the original word is the word that we get the, or the, 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 the Hebrew word that we get the term grace for, that I might show grace to. Now, verse two, we're never going to make it if I keep going like this, huh? Maybe it'll be part two next week, but we'll just keep going here. Verse two, now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, show the kindness of God to him or the grace of God to him? See, Ziba, they bring this, this old man, this old servant who had served in Saul's court. They bring him in, and David says, Hey, you're aware of what's happened to Saul's family, what's happened to Jonathan's clan, his kids. Is there anyone left? Is there somebody that I could show the grace of God to? 
You see, what's awesome about this is this, this, this desire from David, a man after God's own heart, to, to literally pass on to others what God had passed on to him, to give to others what God had given to him, to give other people the very same grace that God had given to him. It wasn't just a theory. It was something that he didn't want to just think about. He wanted to live it out. He wanted to make it practical. He wanted to make it real. And I don't know about you, but I am so challenged by that because I spend a lot of time just thinking, right? Spend a lot of time thinking, well, I should do this and I could do this. If only I could and whatnot. Well, David shows some initiative and, and really desires to do it so much so that he sends for a man named Ziba, a servant who had served under Saul and brings him to the court. And Ziba said to the king, verse three, There's, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. What's interesting about this is you get the sense, here's the, this, this, if I can get through this whole night without crying, I will be amazed. Because you get the sense that the king's court, David and all of the people around him, you get the, you get the sense that the people around him knew exactly what David wanted to do. He wanted to show kindness and grace. And you get the sense that they understood what that might mean. That might mean that instead of living way out there in the outskirts of a dry and desolate and weary land, that the king might bring them into his family, into his court, so to speak. But the king's court, just so you know, uh, when other kings were ruling, the king's court was no place for crippled feet. The king's court was not a place for broken people. The king's court was not a place for anyone who was less than their best. Now, if you're a Bible student and you've read this before and you know where we're going, and so I would just encourage you to allow your knowledge of where we're going to go with this to just overwhelm your heart with the grace and love of God's uh, the, the grace of, of God's love for you because it's exactly our story. And the king said to Ziba, well, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Makir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Lodabar describes a geographical region that was desolate, dry, weary on the outskirts. It was a perfect place to hide away for your life. Why would, why would this be happening? Well, we'll get there in just a moment. And the king, verse 5, Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Mekir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And, verse 6, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. Is there anyone left in Saul's family that I could show the grace of God to? Anybody know anyone? Well, we know this old servant who knows Saul, who knew Saul and all of his relatives. Let's go ask him. Ziba comes in. Yeah, there is this grandson of Saul, son of Jonathan. He's still alive, but he's imperfect. He's been broken. He's not whole. He's not fit for a king's court. He doesn't belong here. And David said, where is he? Well, he's way out in the middle of nowhere, hiding out. Who's he hiding from? You. Why? Because he's afraid you're going to kill him. Because that's what the new kings always do. They kill the old king's family. Go get him. <laughs> okay. Can you imagine? It's worth the drama. Can you imagine? We don't know how many years. We do know that Mephibosheth went into hiding when he was five years old. According to 2 Samuel chapter 4, when Saul and Jonathan died, Mephibosheth's nursemaid picked him up and started to run so that she could hide him because she also knew that the new kings always kill the old king's family and this little boy shouldn't have to pay that kind of price. 
So she picks him up to run for his life, to hide him out. But in her haste, according to 2 Samuel chapter 4, she trips and he falls and he's crippled from that moment on, broken, wounded by the fall. And for who knows how long he's carried off to this place that's out in the middle of nowhere, living in obscurity, crippled, meaning depending on the hospitality and the kindness and the graciousness of everyone else, not able to take care of himself like you and I can, like they could. No doubt, hopeless. This is going to be my life. This house, this square mile, because if I go any further, I might get found out. And if I get found out, I'll probably die. So this is it. This is my life, and it's really small. It's really lonely. And it's really hopeless. And it's really frustrating. And I don't know how long I can handle it. I suggest to you that he went into hiding at five, and later in this story we'll read that he actually had children when David found him. It was a long time that he had to feel like that. And one day, there's a knock on the door. And this day that he had feared for years and years and years was about to happen. He had feared, no doubt, that at some point the king's guard would find him out and they would come knocking. They would take him to the king's court and he would most likely lose his life. So there's a knock at his door. And Mephibosheth is literally carried to the king's court. And he's introduced to the king, David. (laughs) Did you guys, you guys are aware that Jesus, our Savior and King and Lord, comes comes through the line of David. We're aware of this, yes? David. Is introduced to Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth immediately bows down. He goes low. He fell on his face, and he paid homage. One scholar said that in falling on his face, he may have been expecting a blade to fall on his neck. You see, we don't live like that, right? This is just this is an old story. It's going to make us feel good in the end. But they were living, Mephibosheth, David, Ziba, all these other people in the court, king's court, they were living this reality. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. Mercy. <laughs> and David said to him, Do not fear, <laughs> for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore you to all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Unbelievable mercy and grace. Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. I'm going to keep my word for your sake that I gave to your father. And not only that, all the land that your grandfather had, you know, the one who tried to kill me all the time, (laughs) all of his land is now yours. But you're not going to have to tend it. I'll give you servants for that. Because I'm going to welcome you into my court forevermore. You're going to eat at my table. You're no longer going to have to to survive on the scraps of generous or not so generous people. You're going to sit and eat and dine at the king's table for the rest of your life. Mephibosheth went to the king's court that day thinking he was going to die. And the king gave him back his life. Because that's what love and grace and mercy from God does. Just so you know, by the way, side note for us who are believers, who are Christians, who have accepted God's love, grace, and mercy, it's about time to get living. God's desire is to actually restore our life. 
to rise us above the muck and the mire, to reach down and pull us up out of all of that, that we might actually begin to really live. And if you want to know what really living is like, then I I say look no further than the Gospels and start paying attention to Jesus and what he did and what he taught and how he acted. This is what God's heart is. (laughs) Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? It's too good to be true for Mephibosheth. Notice Mephibosheth doesn't say, It's about time. I knew about that promise, and I've been waiting for years. No, Mephibosheth isn't prideful, arrogant, or entitled. He's humble. He knew what his state was. He knew what was going to happen to him. And so he says, what did I do that you would actually give a dead dog like me life and life abundant? Are you guys seeing the pictures of what God has done for us in Christ? They are jumping out of this story at every single sentence. It's so amazing. The story keeps going. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to, and, and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, Your master's grandson shall always eat at my table. Just so you know, that meant so much more than having three squares a day. It was a privilege. He was part of the family, so to speak. He would be taken care of. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, and then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. Just in case we forgot, we're reminded that God made a place for somebody who didn't belong. He made a way for him to belong. Didn't take away his crippledness, by the way. It would have been a testimony to anyone and everyone. You see, before David called for Mephibosheth, this crippledness was just a testimony of very difficult and tough times. But now is a testimony of so much more that if the king would follow after God's heart, Mephibosheth would be a testimony to anyone and everyone paying attention to, paying attention or listening. Mephibosheth would be a testimony that there is room at the king's table for crippled, broken, hurting, battered, beaten, and messed up people because God's grace can draw them in. It's an amazing story. It is a beautiful account. It is awesome history. We should all, just so you know, we should all remember the name Mephibosheth and the testimony and the story because we would do, it would be awesome to be able to go and tell people about this Old Testament guy named Mephibosheth and what King David did for him and why he did it. And then cut right to the chase and talk about Jesus. And the reality that Mephibosheth probably represents all of us much more than we realize. That's the gospel, you guys. There's beauty in that. But I've wondered for years, like, what, 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 What is with David? What is with this one who God said was a man after his own heart? What would motivate 
such an act of kindness and grace and mercy and graciousness and wealth and prosperity and, and goodness and all that God is, what would, what would make some man do this when he didn't have to? Did you know that he would have been keeping his promises to both Saul and Jonathan if he just left him out on the outskirts and let him live? His word would have been intact. But remember, David is, David is the, he's a, he's like Jesus is coming and David is pointing to him. And could it be that David is saying this? When a little bit of love will do, God will give you much more than that. When a little bit, I always think about it like this. We know that, that our sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb, right? And would a little, one drop of the perfect blood of Jesus would have washed away the sins of the world. What did he do? He gave pints, maybe even gallons of it. Like extravagant, exuberant, like overabundant Love, what would, what would make a guy do this when he didn't have to do that? Now, don't get me wrong. Next week, even as I mentioned, we're going to see David wasn't perfect. But this is a pretty amazing moment. If you look at Psalm 103, I want to encourage you to turn there. David writes some things that I think served as motivation. In Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5, he writes of God's mercy he says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. David didn't just write of God's mercy. I suggest to you, if you look at that and remember David's experiences, he knew of God's mercy. He experienced God's mercy. He had received God's mercy. So the greatest thing he could do would be to give it out. He goes on in verses 6 through 14, and he writes of God's compassion. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is, the steadfast love, is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has does he remove our transgressions from us as the father shows compassion to his children so the lord shows compassion to those who fear him for he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust he remembers that without his compassion we are nothing and again david didn't just know this he didn't just write about it he experienced it he knew of god's loving kindness in verse 15 he says this, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field for the wind passes over it and it is gone and his place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. David had embraced and been embraced by the loving kindness of God, and it had a profound impact upon his life. It didn't just affect what he believed, it affected how he behaved. And one day he sent and called for Mephibosheth because of it. Because this is God's will. Look at verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, who his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David had experienced the greatness of God's steadfast love and mercy and compassion and God, kindness and the beauty and the perfection of his will. And genuine belief produces, I suggest, gracious behavior. And he passes it on to Mephibosheth. David pa simply 
gave out what God had given to him. So the question begs to be asked tonight. Okay, (laughs) am I supposed to just feel warm and fuzzy in my heart? And I would say, yeah, actually, I'm a big fan of the warm and fuzzies, especially if they come from Scripture. So yeah, like we're supposed to feel amazed by God's grace shown through David to Mephibosheth because it points to God's grace shown to us through Jesus. And that should make us feel warm and fuzzy in our faith. So yes, Feel all the feels, as the kids say these days. But more than that, it should elicit something from us. His mercy should, should, should bring about a response from his people. We see it in David, and the world should see it in us. We should have gratitude for God's grace. We should have gratitude. We should be grateful for God's grace, thankful for his mercy and kindness, and his patience and his love. Because if I haven't made it clear, let me state it one more time. In the spiritual reality of our lives, we have been more like Mephibosheth than we have David. I want to be David in the story, but I know I'm more like Mephibosheth. That in my sin and my struggles was hiding out in the middle of nowhere, just hoping that I wouldn't be found out. In fact, if you know my testimony, you know that the night before I came to know Jesus and, give, and gave my life to the Lord, I literally called a Jesus person that I knew. I didn't know what else to call him. His name was Lloyd. But I called him and I literally said, what if it's all true? If it's all true, I'm in trouble. Because I had come to an end of my hiding out. Because I realized if it's all true and there really is an accounting, if there really is justice, and if God's word is really, I'm in big trouble because I, I fear I'm on the wrong side. And if he's really king, then he's probably going to do what all the other leaders in my life has done, and he's going to get rid of me. You guys see that? <laughs> and Lloyd, if you will, carried me, broken, bruised, battered, and beaten, carried me to a table where I was, if you will, fed the gospel, where I was given hope in Jesus. You see, we're Mephibosheth, and God has done exactly what we just read that David did for Mephibosheth, God has done for us. That forevermore, by the way, we belong in his courts, And there will be a day, just so you know, where God prepares a table and we will sit forevermore with him in abundance. Like, that's our story. And we of all people should have a humble and grateful attitude about it. We should be grateful for God's grace, but at the same time, we should also be committed to it. Turn to, really quick, we'll close with this. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can find verse 14. Paul says this, for the love of Christ controls us. I started there on purpose because I think because of God's grace, we should recognize that we're people who should be controlled, controlled by God's love. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Paul's saying, hey, we're controlled by Jesus. And we've come to conclude that Jesus is the one that we were always waiting for who died in our place so that we could die to sin and live to righteousness so that we could live forevermore, not for our own sake, excuse me, but for his. He goes on, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Paul's saying, look, we used to think that Jesus was just a man, but we've come to realize he's not. And therefore, because of Jesus' reality in our life, we won't think about men as just men. We'll see that God has a spiritual, eternal desire for the soul of every person. He goes on, and he says this in in verse 17, therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us, Paul says, the message of reconciliation. You see, the account of David and Mephibosheth all the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 9 is a beautiful picture of the reconciliation message that belongs to us for the world. That which we can offer those who are hopeless, broken, bruised, battered, beaten, struggling, wondering if this is it. We have something to offer them. Therefore, Paul says in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ's sake. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of God, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What is our response? It is to stay committed to God's grace because of the work of God's Son, who, just like David did for Mephibosheth, looked for us. And just like David did for Mephibosheth, called for us. And just like David did for Mephibosheth, continues to care for us. We should embrace not only this story intellectually and be blown away by the history of some of God's people, but we should embrace this story spiritually and be more and more committed to living it out practically that we could actually be ambassadors and we have been given an amazing message. I suggest to you, David and Mephibosheth is just one of many that we can share, that can tell a bruised, beaten, battered, and broken world that God has a place at his table for them if they will only come, bow down, and believe that Jesus has bridged the gap on their behalf.